Ricardo. Uh, this will be a short talk because or originally we planned uh, three of the presentations to showcase some of the work we do with the milk checkoff uh, projects. You've seen uh, uh, Corwin Nelson this morning and Joe Vendramini. And then this is my th the third one that uh, we just sort of briefly show some of the results from a milk checkoff. That's obviously a very important program to us. Um, I'll promise you there's a lot more than what I show here today and I'll be in print and you'll see that in the popular press as well if you haven't seen any of it yet. Okay, so before um, I show some data, I want to acknowledge um, some other people. Haley de Chasse was actually a master's student at Wageningen University where I uh, graduated from as well. Uh, and Henk Hogeveen is a professor of animal uh, health economics out there. And Haley wanted to do an internship coming from the Netherlands here, and he was interested in welfare. Everything is about welfare if you go to school in Western Europe these days. I said, well, welfare, uh, how about we look for something that has a little bit more economic application, and so stocking density seemed to fit that bill quite well, okay? Um, so Haley was here several years ago for uh, three months, and what I present is sort of a follow-up of the initial work that he did. And I also uh, use quite a few slides from Peter Crozel at University of Tennessee, who is more uh, um, in behavior research, okay? So and then obviously uh, Southeast Milk for some of the funding. So when we talk about stocking density, there's ma different ways to measure that, right? So we talk about cows per stall, and that's actually the number of cows per stall, that's actually the number, uh, the measure that I will use. Feed bunk space per cow, which might be actually more important in some cases than cows per stall. We could talk about total area per cow or the amount of shade per cow. Um, we can talk about transition cow stocking density. We can talk about lactating cows and stocking density. I will talk about just lactating cows and I'm meaning not fresh anymore uh, uh, cows here in this data that I show. Um, all the literature that I read and all the experts I, you know, um, talk to as well, they say transition cows don't overstock, okay, don't overstock. But for lactating cows, as I'll show you, that might be slightly different. So first, a little bit of statistics on overstocking statistics here. Um, okay, this is uh, already a little bit old from uh, USA NAMS dairy survey, and they, they looked at uh, cows per stall, they surveyed about 2,500 farms, and they found 57% uh, of farms overstocked to some extent. That means more cows than stalls, okay? And so if you have, um, yeah. <coughs> if you have, for example, 105 here, that means 105 cows per 100 stalls. So a little bit of overstocking, okay? Obviously their scale didn't go very deep, right? They had 110, so 110 cows per 100 stalls or more. Uh, but as I will show you, overstocking in some cases could be beneficial if you go, um, co if you overstock quite a bit more than 10%. All right, a survey from Jeffrey Buley when he was a grad student at, uh, at Wisconsin um, from 1999. So they uh, looked at uh, 4 0 barns, um, they on average overstocking or stocking density was 111%, so 11% uh, overstocking. And six row barns, less overstocking, measured by cows per stall, okay? So only 104 cows per 100 stalls. That makes sense because on a six row barn, probably feeding space, it's much more the limiting factor, right? So in order to provide enough feeding space, when you have three rows of cows behind you, uh, you're going to put fewer cows in those stalls. But some overstocking as well. This is more uh, stall stocking density data. Um, this is uh, surveyed on from data from British Columbia, California, and the Northeastern United States. Okay, the right one. And so this is 100 cows, 100 stalls, and this is all overstocked here. The top one here is the Northeast of the United States, say New York, right? And so if you looked at the 45 farms that they had in about every uh, survey there, um, you know, in the Northeast, let's say more than 80% overstocked, okay? And those other dairies, those other areas there, maybe 50% uh, got overstocked. So if you look at, well, overstocking are there pros and cons, right? So overstocking reduces the cow's ability to practice her natural behaviors. 
we'll have, I'll have a few data on the lying time, for example, okay? Um, we know that overstocking very much depends on facilities and, gr and, and grouping as well. Um, and we'll see that. But overstocking makes sense economically sometimes, and that's where my data was about. And so the question then was, okay, well, how much overstocking is, is profitable? Okay, very quick, time budget for a lactating cow. Okay, maybe three to five hours uh, of eating per day. Um, she's lying down 10 to 14 hours per day. Maybe two to three hours per day she's standing or walking in the alley. Uh, maybe half an hour per day of uh, drinking. Um, and that leaves about two and a half to three and a half hours uh, of milking time uh, per day. Okay, so to make it 24 hours per day. If we look at how people evaluated stocking density, a lot of stu- I pushed the wrong button here. There we go. A lot of studies looked at lying time. Okay. So this is a relative response to lying time, okay? And this is, this is stocking density, so 120% again is 20 uh, more cows than stalls in, when you have 100 stalls. And it seems to here, if you put a break out of these eight studies that were put together here by Peter Krozel, we see a response as far as lying time at about 120%, okay? If you go past 120%, we really see some uh, lower lying times per cow Okay, well, but that's lying time, right? That's not dollars. Um, some data from uh, Rick Grant from New York. Um, this is resting time as well, and now this is milk yield, okay, uh, from a study. And he found about 3.7 pounds per day more milk for each hour these cows were laying down. All right. A little bit more data on, on milk yield. This is now stalls per cow instead of cows per stall, stalls per cow. And this is Spanish data from uh, Alex Bach. Um, and again, so overstocking happens more on this side and lower milk yield. And then if you have fewer cows per stall, quite an increase in milk yield. And that's valuable, right? Because we can value milk production. We can't, it's hard to value stocking, uh, uh, lying time. You know, what's, what's lying time worth if this does not result in milk production or reproduction or feed intake, okay? So if I put both studies from um, Alex Bach and then the lying data and Rick Grant's data together, you get about 1.2 pounds less milk per day for 10% greater stocking density from 100 to 110% or from 110 to 120%, okay? A linear, a linear decrease. Um, and this is actually the best data we can find. And so one of the problems we found is that the effects of stocking density on quantitative measures of cow production, there's not many studies out there. So we had to work with what we, what we had. Um, that was milk production. We only found one study that looked at conception rates, okay, or fertility. I mean, this is from, from Wisconsin. Um, stocking density up to 150%. And this is data from lots of uh, farms that they analyzed, and a slow decrease there in, in conception rate, okay, fertility. A little, bit of, a little bit of decrease, but not a whole lot. All right, so that's enough to put some uh, economics together, okay? And so maybe uh, first a few principles here, all right? So we're talking about marginal economics, right? And the idea is here, if I add one more cow to my pen, then as a whole, you know, I'm interested in my pen's profitability. Maybe my profitability per cow may go down, but, but for the pen, uh, it, may, it may go up because that is our limiting factor, all right? And so we basically keep adding cows to the pen until the pen's profitability uh, maximizes. And if we add one more cow, then yes, this one more cow will produce milk, you know, but at the same time, the, the collective effect of too much overcrowding reduces everybody else's milk production and fertility so much that this one more cow does not uh, overcome, say, the negative effects of all the other cows in the pen, okay? And so then we can use a spreadsheet and say, hey, how far can we keep adding cows um, to find what is an optimal uh, stocking density? So that's what I did here. We did cows per stall, and we had only milk production and fertility in this data. I think data that's uh, 
showing up in Journal of Dairy Science. We also have some uh, culling data in there, but here milk production fertility. And then we had a big spreadsheet, if you will, and we changed stocking density from 100 to 150%. And then we looked at, okay, we could measure what does that do to the profitability of, of the pen. Okay. And so here I have a certain milk price that I put in. Okay, a reasonable price. And this is then my loss per 10% more cows per, uh, <coughs> per day. Okay, so the literature would say, you have about this blue line, 1.2 pounds. But I said, well, that sounds pretty conservative, right? Because we weren't quite convinced the literature was very strong. So if we had a s bigger uh, decrease than 1.1 pound, 1.5 pounds, or 2 pounds per 10% more, you could see what that did to our optimal profit per stall, right? And so even if we have, do not have much of a decrease in milk, uh, production and yes we have some decrease in conception rate you'd go actually up to 150 percent stocking density i stopped at 150 percent because there was absolutely no data beyond that if you believe this is a more realistic response to stocking density you would pick out at about 123 percent stocking density and actually for the stall if you look at per stall you know that'd be a gain of maybe 40 almost 50 dollars per stall compared to no overstocking here. If we had a much bigger decrease, or two pounds, um, then we peaked at 108%. So just a little bit over, no overstocking at all. If you overstocked a lot, obviously, uh, you know, uh, the remainder of those cows uh, produce so much less milk that this, these extra cows don't make up for that. So, so losses there. Here I used, again, uh, I changed my milk price some, right, not a big change, and I used this 1.5 pounds uh, per day per 10% stocking density, sort of the average there uh, that, I, that I used, and a little more than actually the literature says, and see what that does to my optimal stocking density, okay? If I have a pretty decent milk price, 23 here, okay, I would have, I would, my maximum here is at about 140%. If I drop my milk price a lot, I would not overstock at all in this scenario. Very sensitive to reasonable changes in milk price. And we know like in Florida, you know, our prices jump even more than that, right? But the conclusion was that obviously with low milk prices, you don't want to overstock. And I think sometimes producers seem to overcome maybe cash flow, let's put more cows perhaps in the barn because milk prices are low. Well, that seems to be the opposite thing of what you want to do. Um, we looked a little bit at reproduction. In this case, um, I think this was estrogen detection rate. Okay, we changed that. I changed that some in my spreadsheet. And if you look at the, the optimum profits, that's the peak again here, right? It's fairly similar, right? Between maybe 115 to 125 percent. Repro did not make a big effect here. Uh, as far as we could tell, on um, optimal stocking density economically. Um, also looked at, okay, given the same profit per stall, how much milk um, can you afford to lose per 10% then, or per cow, yeah, that's kilos per, this is kilos then per cow per day. And um, this is at $18 milk, this is at $23 milk. So this is a graph, I hope that's also in your proceedings, you can you can see, okay, by so much stocking density, I can go down if I have a good milk price, right? Then I can lose up to two kilos per day, and then I make about the same amount of milk there um, as I don't overstock and I don't have a negative effect there. So we can do all kinds of variations there, and I have a spreadsheet that it's available soon where you can play with all these uh, uh, input sum prices and effects on overstocking, and it will nicely show you where the peak is for overstocking density. Uh, <clears throat> and also, you know, what if you don't have the optimal stocking density, what your, what your losses would be. So I've been telling this story in a little bit more extended version at a variety of places, right? And this one consultant emailed me later and said, well, you know, this farmer's decision to overstock by 30%, which we would consider pretty heavy overstocking, resulted in very large milk checks to, to milk prices, okay, even though his milk per cow remained level. So in this case, he didn't even 
see a decrease in milk production, uh, I think, okay? And so at least this consultant learned that overstocking was not necessarily a bad thing. This was also when milk prices were, uh, you know, were better than they, are, than they are today. But I think it sort of opened up um, some people's minds that, hey, at least there's some economics to overstocking and things are actually very sensitive to reasonable shifts in prices. Well, my student was interested in welfare when he came, right, uh, our uh, student. So a few welfare assessment measures, the amount of lying time or uh, stall use index, cow number of cows lying that are uh, not versus not eating or cows eating simultaneously. Um, he, he, in his thesis, put some graphs, and you would see that all these welfare assessments decrease some with overstocking, right? So as we might uh, imagine that obviously, or obviously, there is some penalty to pay for, for welfare, uh, generally, if you overstock too much. Um, I'm not the one to tell you how to balance welfare versus economics here, okay? I just want to bring up that, yes, there may be some negative effects on welfare. I know, for example, in Denmark, welfare uh, is, or overcrowding is, overstocking is not allowed by law there because they favor welfare so strongly that uh, you cannot put more cows uh, in the barn than you have stalls. All right, so all these data, um, the, the literature was actually pretty weak on effects of overstocking on effects on cow performance, often because many of these studies are done in a, in a very short time span, for example, just say a few weeks where some student looks at the effect of overstocking on behavior, but long-term effects may not be uh, included. As a result of this, though, uh, my colleague Henk Hogeveen, you know, he's in the Netherlands, and the Netherlands milk quota went away in April of last year. And so all these Dutch dairymen have been adding cows. They've been adding 10, 20 percent more cows. And so he's now collecting data from accountants' uh, offices to, you know, have, have real cow data, farm data, to see what, what uh, overstocking does to farm profitability. So hopefully we'll come back with some, uh, some real data in addition to the modeling. So again, so overstocking is prof probably profitable under some plausible, reasonable conditions. 120% is a reasonable number. And then when, uh, um, and so when milk prices are low, you want to overstock less. And there's some welfare concern. And the paper is in press in Journal Dairy Science. And there's also a spreadsheet, and that will be in our newsletter, uh, newsletter as well. And so you could play with some of these inputs and see what that does to overstocking economics. That's all I have here, so thank you. Okay, we have time for a few questions. So all of your data is on lactating cows. How important do you think overstocking those transition cows sets the cows up to perform well being overstocked and lactating? So your question is about Overstocking on transition cows first? I, no, I guess my question is, is do you think that cows that are overstocked in transition would have performed as well? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know that. So the data we have um, doesn't, doesn't, didn't show that. I mean, you've done overstocking work. Maybe you can answer uh, Melanie's uh, question here. We, we didn't overstock, but we uh, had um, in the prepartum cows that were at 100% headlock versus 80% head loss, and we saw no improvements whatsoever. No improvements on immune function, no improvements on health or production. We saw some changes in behavior, uh, maybe a little less time lying down, uh, more competition in the feed bunk than the 80%, but ultimately no effect that we could say is a welfare issue. Um, this was work done in Jersey, and everybody complained that you know, they were Jersey milk. But Steve LeBlanc from uh, Wealth did a study with Holstein cows, I mean, there are more cows in old jerseys, and he did 120% versus 80%, and he saw no difference whatsoever. So I don't think anybody would say it's okay to overstock prepartum cows, but I guess I, I, I and some other people will probably say it's okay to be at 100% stock and entry of the feed bunk space as long as you have good water, good stall quality, good cooling, and so on and so forth. Well, I always wonder, too, I worked with a very large dairy in Michigan, and they over 
fact, 130% in the last year in cows, but yet all of the transition cows are a separate facility, 75% stock, the, the best facility. And they always said, I mean, that, I mean, they had a 30 strike rate, you know. Yeah. The one comment about those studies is that they were separate, separating cows from heifers. So that's a big, important note about the study. But I guess when you look at the data, yeah, it doesn't seem to be there. I, I've had a lot of experience with this, about 35 years, and most of it was poor, not a, a, a freely made decision in reducing budget cuts or, you know, how to tear down a barn or build one up or whatever we were doing. But it seems like to me that the biggest problem you have when you're overstocked is injuries to the cattle. And uh, these are significant injuries. They, they, your help will heal a cow with the frame loader and run her and they go for $2,000, $3,000. And there's a lot of tipping cattle over and, and their necks getting caught in the, in the stall divider and even killing them. Okay. I don't have data on that. It's, 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 I mean, obviously, I, or obviously I would say the folks that measured milk production versus stocking density, if there's injury causing some of that reduction in milk production, some of that may be included already. So I'm not sure if injury should be just a totally added negative factor. Obviously, that would reduce the optimal overstocking density. But there's a scarcity, really, of data. So at least I think the study opened people's eyes and said, hey, some basic thing is overstocking on, on cow performance is not just well documented. Yeah. I didn't find your study on uh, either. <laughs> yeah, that just surprised me also. You know, having the uh, actually a benefit from overstocking under, under any condition. Oh, really? Oh, it's, it's no, uh, for me, it's no brainer at all. I mean, obviously, one overstock some. Many yeah, I <laughs> think so. Yeah. It seems, I mean, if you look at the survey data and people I talk to, they do overstock to some extent, right? I mean, Melody has only 30%, usually maybe 15, 10, 15% that range. And so let me tell you another caveat now you bring it up. This literature says basically a linear decrease, right? If you go, if you lose X kilos or pounds per 10%, then you lose twice that for the next overstocking, and you know, so it's say a linear decrease. In reality, it's probably, a, you know, the effect gets stronger and stronger. So if you go from 100% to 110%, not much an effect. But if you went from 120 to 130%, maybe a much more effect for that same change in overstocking. And that's also not documented. We have one more quick question. Yeah. Yeah, so milk price, yeah, so the cow eats the same, so obviously it's an income over feed cost, you, you know, and so obviously one more cow, that cow doesn't have to pay for facilities, she just, she eats, um, she has some other variable cost, but, you know, I mean, that income over feed cost really drives the value of putting that extra cow in there, even at the, you know, at the cost of some of the other cows that are already in that barn. Yeah, marginal milk. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Big okay. All right. Our next um, speaker is. Uh,